Hi, I'm Richard Sedlock. Welcome to the Green Ninja course on climate science. In episode 21, we investigate how scientists use analytical models to evaluate climate and possible climate change. Here's the concept map of Earth's climate system that I introduced in episode 4. Even though the map is far from complete, it clearly shows the staggering complexity of Earth's climate system. How can we predict or project the climate of the future for so complex a system. We use global climate models, mathematical representations of physical processes and components of the Earth's climate system. Many types of models have been developed, but the most sophisticated are general circulation models, or GCMs. The goal of a general circulation model is to take local interactions of climate components and infer from them how the climate system will respond to changes on a regional or global scale. It's an immense conceptual design and computation challenge. Many of the most brilliant scientific minds on the planet are working on it, as are some of the world's largest computing facilities. As in any scientific undertaking, climate modeling makes mistakes and learns from them. Climate modelers improve their procedures. Modern climate models include more features than earlier ones. By this point, GCMs do a very satisfactory job of simulating climate in the recent past. Later, we'll see evidence for this and why it matters. First, though, let's work our way through part of a GCM. In this case, the complete six-box climate model. <laughs> Just kidding. It's sufficient to glance at the figure and appreciate some of the conceptual and programming challenges that have to be addressed. As I tell my students, this is not on the final exam. Now, one key aspect of climate models is the scale over which the data are collected and analyzed and presented. The grid on this map of North America, which, by the way, shows uh, projected changes in humidity, is 300 to 400 kilometers on a side. Well, that doesn't allow for much detail or fine-tuning. The results will be much more generalized, much coarser, than if smaller boxes had been used, as they were in this map. Let's see, this one shows projected changes in extreme weather. So what matters here is the grid size, not what's being shown. The grid boxes here are just a few tens of kilometers on a side. So much more detail can be preserved and presented. Of course, the increased number of boxes means a huge increase in the raw number of data and a much larger computational challenge. As computer power and speed have increased, climate modelers have been able to tackle smaller and smaller grid boxes. In fact, the desire to process more climate data and to do it faster has helped stimulate fundamental developments in computing, particularly involving supercomputer clusters. Now, I debated omitting this slide, which may involve more of the nitty-gritty of modeling than you care about. If that's the case, just tune out and do something else until the next slide. Grid boxes in many global climate models are 10 to 100 kilometers across, but that's still far larger than many of the elements of the climate system. For example, a, a cumulus cloud is less than a kilometer across, and, and the equations describing winds and other relevant processes within a cloud operate over much smaller distances. Well, GCMs can't handle small features like clouds directly, so they use parameterizations, simplified processes that are sufficiently accurate substitutes or proxies for actual finer scale features and processes. Parameterizations are constantly being refined to produce more sophisticated, inclusive, and accurate representations of climate. This refinement, plus the inclusion of more components, the decrease of grid box size, and other programming improvements, have resulted in impressive increases in the usefulness and accuracy of global climate models. No, the models aren't perfect yet, and they never will be. Pundits who claim that climate modeling is futile because the models aren't perfect are merely demonstrating their own misunderstanding of how models are used, and the fact of how science works. Here's an example of how global climate models are tested prior to their use in projecting future climate. A viable model should be able to simulate the climate of the recent past. So we find a bunch of GCMs, which are produced by different research groups around the globe. We feed each model with the appropriate starting values, and we see if the models can simulate what actually happened in the 20th century. 
So this diagram shows 20th century temperatures as calculated by 58 simulations produced by 14 different GCMs. The 58 results are shown as a mass of superimposed yellow curves. The average of those 58 is the red line. The black line shows the temperature as it was actually recorded. First, it's clear that the differences among the simulations are minor. For instance, no yellow curves move from upper left to lower right. Second, the model average does a particularly good job of simulating the observed temperatures. Right, The red and the black lines follow each other. Third, all of the models and the model average are sensitive enough to detect the effects of major volcanic eruptions. Some of them are labeled here, Agong, El Chichon, and Pinatubo. Each of these cooled global, global temperature, but only for a year or two. So even over that small time scale, these models were able to pick them up. So if GCMs do such a good job with past climate, then we can feel at least guardedly confident about turning them loose on the climate of the future. This graph expands the simulation tests that we just talked about. In each graph, the black line shows the actual temperatures that were recorded in the 20th century, whether for a region like Europe or Africa, or in the bottom row, for all land surfaces, or all oceans, or the entire globe. In each graph, the blue band shows the results of 19 simulations from five GCMs that only used natural forcings to predict what the temperatures were in the 20th century. Human-caused changes were explicitly eliminated from these tests so that we could have a, a natural effects only baseline. The pink band shows the results of 58 simulations from 14 GCMs that used not only natural forcings, but also anthropogenic forcings, in other words, human-induced changes. Well, what can we infer from these experiments? Here I've selected three of the nine graphs, but any of them could have been used. Which of these seven statements is supported by the experiments? More than one answer may be correct. So what I want you to do here is pause me and just on a sheet of paper or whatever, jot down the numbers of these, which of the seven here are supported by the experiments that we just discussed. So pause me and don't restart until you've decided. The experiments support statements 2, 3, and 6. Statement 1 is not true. Human factors didn't make much of a difference from 1900 to 1950. The observed curves are tracked well by the blue all-natural bands, so statement 2 is true. But from 1950 to 2000, the blue all-natural band doesn't cut it. Only by adding the human impacts, which are included in the pink band, do the simulations track the observations. The statement 3 is true, but statement 4 is not. So for climate models to tell us anything about the future climate that's useful, they must account for both natural and anthropogenic forcings. The statement 6 is true, and statements 5 and 7 are not. This diagram exact um, examines the effects of various factors on Earth's temperature over the last thousand years. Units on the vertical axis are in watts per meter squared and are referred to as forcings. The top part of the diagram shows the impact of volcanic eruptions on temperature. Note that the, um, the four, that four different curves are included and that they very nearly lay on top of one another. Now we talked about these data um, I talked about them in an earlier episode, episode 14. The ash and aer um, aerosols from eruptions produce a sharp drop in temperature because so much radiation is reflected back into space. But the effect is temporary. Within a few years, the ash and the aerosols settle down out of the atmosphere into the Earth's surface or into the oceans, and the climate stabilizes. The middle part of the diagram shows several tightly grouped estimates of the impact of variable solar output on Earth's climate. Over the last thousand years, the sun has had a roughly constant effect, with century-long rises and falls more or less averaging out. 
The bottom part of the diagram includes all other forcings, chiefly the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. These forcings had negligible impact on climate until the early 1800s, but they really took off, especially in the second half of the 20th century, starting around the year 1950, corresponding with major post-World War II accelerations in many human activities, population growth, industrialized agriculture, gasoline and diesel consumption, deforestation, and a whole lot more. No serious climate scientist doubts that human activities are major influences on modern climate. Currently, global climate models are constructed so that stable climates are the only possible outcome of their experimental runs. And here, stable refers to the meaning we discussed in episode 4. If some factor changes, well, negative feedbacks will counter the effects of some disturbance and limit the climate change. However, as climate models incorporate more components and get more complex, previously unaccounted for feedbacks will develop, and the models may begin to predict complex, possibly chaotic climate behavior. In other words, an unstable climate. Earth's climate system may become so disturbed or disrupted that it crosses some threshold value that the models currently don't recognize, and beyond which predictable, stable behavior may not be possible. Such thresholds are referred to as tipping points. The stable future climates assumed by current climate models may not be appropriate, and future climate changes may be much larger than those that are usually anticipated. That's the end of episode 21.